And I think most of the time when people say range of motion, they're actually referring to how far the implement is going. And, and I think that's really where we get into some of the distinction here when we're like, all right, you know, this distant move, th this implement moves a greater distance through space, but then we have to ask what's moving and do we want that to move? And then again, you know, what's the direction of resistance, therefore, you know, what tissues are being loaded and then we can get very specific into the goal besides just saying that, you know, more is better because you get more stuff. Yeah. And I think a, gr a great example um, that we talked about last week uh, was just the concept of a leg press and the sort of, you know, lower spine motion and leg press and how the foot plate visually moves farther back, closer to people's uh, chests. And so people consider that to be better than stopping it a little bit earlier but we talked last week about how, you know, that is kind of coming from a place of, um, you know, spinal motion where we may not be trying to train spinal motion. So that's a good uh, a potential example there. Um, and that's an example where that motion can, will start to come from another uh, joint or set of joints. So, you know, in the, in a leg press, it's like our hips and our knees and our ankles are moving back and then our spine can start to take over much like in a squat and, you know, how that happens with the butt link. Um, but it can also happen uh, like we can gain that extra motion by sort of being smushed into ourselves. Um, so a good example, maybe like a barbell, uh, you know, bench press or, or a Smith press. I see this happen a lot in where it doesn't really like appear like much else is moving. Um, but people's uh, bones are kind of getting smushed in their, in their, uh, we'll call it passive tissues, you know, like connective tissues that are not bone uh, are being sort of stretched to a greater degree to be pushed, you know, to push someone into a position, uh, you know, i.e. the bar closer to their chest when maybe actively they wouldn't be able to lower that that amount. And, um, you know, I think that has a lot more to do with just losing what I think of as control uh, over the load, you know. So in, in one instance, I think that more range can come through still controlled motion, but just controlled motion where you don't want it necessarily. So, you know, lumbar flexion in the case of a leg press, um, but it can also come through motion at the same joint, but motion that's not under the sort of active category is kind of how I like to think of it. Um, because I think that, you know, when we talk about like the active and the passive elements of contraction, those are both still to me within the um, within the confines of am I controlling this motion with contraction? The whole passive range of motion thing is not something that I see as like extra beneficial. Um, a, another good example that may make sense in more people's heads is just like um, like a pendulum squat, like getting smushed into the bottom of a pendulum squat where the weight can really just um, compress everything down together. Uh, where you might not, again, be sort of actively controlling the contraction of, let's say, your quads in, in, in that one scenario. Um, so I, I think we have these different categories of losing control uh, between motion at, you know, joints that are not supposed to be moving, but then also losing control where we may just lose control of the contraction uh, of the primary tissue. And we may just start to move into the passive elements of that specific joint. Does that frame, does that distinction kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, naturally from this, you know, we start to think about well, what might the consequences be? You know, I'm thinking of examples of that leg press that I've seen. And, you know, on one hand, like we talked about last week, uh, they may be able to use less load. And the explanation may be, well, I'm going through, you know, a greater range of motion at, say, the knee joint, you know, for a leg press or the hip joint. And, you know, maybe some of that motion, you know, is coming from the lumbar spine, but at the same time, you know, we see it represented at the knee as well, you know, where the knee clearly is going through more motion. So then I guess the question becomes like, well, you know, what gets you out of that position? And, you know, to say that there's no, you know, quad involvement, that it's all just, you know, lumbar spine, you know, to get out of that position or, or, or you know, back extensors to get out of that position, you know, I think would be false as well so yeah i think you know it would be interesting for me at least to talk a little bit about like well you know what might happen out of that position because you know whether it be like a let's say a, a triceps uh exercise where you're able to achieve greater you know elbow flexion with the cable pulling you back 
bench press, like you mentioned, leg press, you know, people are able to still use pretty significant loads, feel, you know, good contraction. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as like what might be happening, you know, out of the lengthen position there and how they're able to achieve that? Yeah. So I think a really good example to use um, first will be like something like a pendulum squat esque hack squat, any sort of just highly anchored, uh, constrained lower body pressing scenario. Um, because there is, there is a very big uh, difference or there can be in terms of range. So the first scenario is sort of one in which uh, the person lowers down, they get to a point where they're really actively, you know, pushing into the platform to lower themselves. Like they're not letting any inch of that range not be controlled. And they sort of go down, 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 and they get to like, you know, most of their knee motion um, basically to the point where, you know, their calves are sort of starting to smush against their hamstrings toward the bottom. And there's a moment at which you could choose to continue to push into the platform actively to control the motion. Uh, or you could choose to sort of let go of that a little bit and almost sort of relax into the bottom. And so to me, that extra range still comes at, uh, at the, we'll say, or under the control uh, of the quads, right? Because you are still uh, knee flexing to a greater extent and having to knee extend out of it, right? So there is a technically a greater range of motion at the knee. But to me, the, the, the way I sort of like to think about it is in that first scenario where you're sort of controlling yourself down, you get to the point where your tissues approximate and then you sort of smush everything together to get a little bit lower. That would be scenario A. And then scenario B would be you sort of get to that point and you don't go to the smushing degree. You go maybe to just to where you feel the contact of the calf to the to the back of the hamstring and then and then back out. Those two scenarios usually to people feel like I'm controlling the weight down and one 100 percent and back up. Whereas the, the sort of what we'll call the smushing variation is like, I'm controlling the weight 95%. And then there's this moment where there's this like relaxation where I almost lose it. And then I have to kind of regain it almost out of the bottom. So to me, it's the, it's really um, to, the way that I sort of uh, frame it in terms of understanding it is in one instance, there's a relaxation of what we'll call to be honest, I think it's probably also the quads too in this particular case, but there's certainly a greater relaxation of the the tissues that stabilize the knee, like the cat, like the gastroc and all of the hamstrings. There's a relaxation, a, like a, a lowering of contraction, right? Because, uh, and and this is maybe just something broadly to for people to understand is when you create contraction your muscles bulge, right? Like that's like the, uh, the simple way to think about it is your muscles bulge and they change shape and they get hard when they contract. Like there's no, for the most part, there's usually the sort of tenderness that muscles have when you're just sort of flopping them around. But the second that you go to contract a tissue, it it becomes hard, right? Like people know that, right? But when it comes to, to range of motion, um, in order to lose that stiffness of the contraction, in other words, in order to lose the 100% controlled range of motion, what you have to do is you actually have to uh, let go of some of that control and you have to let go of some of that shape change that you've created, some of that stiffness that you've created to continue to move through range of the joint. So to me, in the instance of the smushing pendulum squat, the smushing hack squat, we are 100% controlled to the point where we're, we've still got that really sort of rock hard contracted, contracted uh, feeling in our tissues and our gastroc and our, and our hamstrings and whatnot. And when we go past that point and we sort of smush to that bottom five to 10%, what we do is we actually, uh, again, essentially move away from maintaining that, that rigid shape. So more range of motion at the joint does occur, but the only way that more range of motion can occur at that point is if we actually lower the degree of tension that we ourselves are creating actively and trade that off for tissues that need to take on that load, we'll say passively. So for me, um, you know, where that gets, where that load gets sort of redistributed more in this particular case is more toward like, we'll say connective tissue of the knee, like patellar tendon type stuff, uh, like uh, ligaments of the knee that hold the knee together, right? ACL, PCL, LCL, um, 
all those guys, the meniscus, right? All those sorts of soft tissue structures that actually control motion. And in addition, you have fluid shifts within the joint that occur to actually allow bones to move further. So bones can be moving further and more closely approximating, in this case, a more knee flexed, knee bent position. Um, but what is controlling that motion in my, uh, you know, uh, under my current paradigm is not sort of uh, the things that we want or aren't the things that we want to be controlling that motion. So a similar example would be, uh, you know, like a triceps extension you mentioned as another example where we can kind of get to a point where we're really sort of maintaining a good amount of tension on the triceps, but we can also sort of smush our forearm uh, past that point almost to a point where we get our elbow flexors, like our biceps to kind of relax so that we can smush our elbow a little bit closer together. And so in that, in that particular case, it's like, uh, beyond a certain point, the, um, the active elements of contraction by necessity have to actually decrease their output in order to continue moving farther. So, um, in terms of my framework around it, I think that generally speaking, people can be in a place where they may not again, feel these sorts of, uh, consequences acutely. It may be something that is sort of like this, uh, slower burn scenario, I just over time have leaned more in the direction of if I cut five degrees, you know, imagine it wasn't bad at all. You know, imagine it, imagine it like it eventually it wouldn't create any sort of downstream negative consequence for my, for my, my joint health. Um, I just don't really think that that kind of trade-off to me um, is the kind of trade-off that will make a difference in the outcome that we want to see um, such that it would be worth taking that potential risk. 